I am Chris Kennedy, architect. I've been involved with uh, designing space habitats for a long time. Um, I'm going to take you on a journey uh, through space architecture. We've been involved with designing space habitats in a variety of ways. And what we're going to do today is look at a variety of habitat designs. Um, you think about architecture and its beginnings and where it came from. And really, it began with uh, the four basic needs of, for humans, food, water, companionship, and shelter. And shelter began in the beginnings from caves and skins stretched over rocks and, and st stretched over sticks. And with that became the shelter architecture. And from that, we have evolved. And so has humanity evolved, and so has architecture along with it. And if you think about architecture, um, in the beginning, you know, the Greek root word of architecture is architecton. And the um, techna is the Greek root word of architecton, which means a challenge for to make something from nothing. And this is the evolution of humanity. And from that, we have evolved, and so has architecture evolved along with us, from this university, these, these buildings, and the, the cities in which we live in. And as we evolved and humans evolved, so is the architecture and, and the uh, development and through the humanity, through uh, systems. Over time, we have uh, progressed. And with that progression, so comes the uh, evolution and living off of and moving away from Earth, moving away from Earth. So this is the evolution where we uh, are moving away from the development of uh, systems here on Earth and moving into space. And I've been involved with that. And Space Station is a good example of where we've taken and have, and have taken the challenges on and evolved through that. And that has evolved into um, new commerce, as we heard earlier, to development in space. Uh, space is a harsh place for us to live and work in. And we've been working to develop that. And you know, space architecture is the design and development of systems in for space. Um, I've been involved with the human exploration destination systems. And as such, we've developed a lot of spaces uh, in architecture to go from living here on Earth, but also you know, for analogs and uh, ocean development, but also moving out from the moon, Mars, and beyond. And that's really where we're trying to evolve from as humans to become a multi-planet species, to move off of Earth and become independent of that. <clears throat> We've developed a number of concepts, and I'll show you in a little bit, of those types of interplanetary transportations, uh, surface bases, and Mars bases. That evolution has, has brought us to a new paradigm, a shift technologically and philosophically towards these types of new habitats. I've been involved in designing these lunar habitats and Mars habitats for years. Um, we have taken that idea of creating living and working spaces on the moon and have developed that into designing and places where we can live. Inflatable habitats has really opened up the options for architects and engineers. And that's really created a whole new genre for us in the way of uh, new opportunities and uh, very exciting opportunities for the future of space. <clears throat> We've uh, been pushing this envelope in, with these technologies. And with that, we're learning a lot about um, you know, water recycling, as well as developing and living off the land. This was a spacecraft that uh, worked on and designed that actually made its own propellant to be able to return to Earth. It's a robotic spacecraft. So I've worked on a variety of things, not just, uh, you know, habitats per se, but also a robotic spacecraft as well. This has helped us to understand uh, what systems are needed to develop you know, and as well to live and learn and, and you know, be all prosperous on these uh, planets. You know, this was a minimally designed spacecraft here that was uh, just for two crew to be able to get down to the moon and explore different locations. The Mars and, and mission planning has developed, been maturing over the years, and inflatable habitats has really made a big impact on that. It's given us the opportunity to be able to put smaller packages on these uh, launch vehicles that have these mass constraints and be able to give us uh, larger volumes and more space to live in. That development has uh, been really been uh, emphasized by the TransHab development, which I was also a co-patent owner on. And that TransHab concept was really the, a breakthrough for us in the sense that 
we took and uh, developed it, and since then, uh, like Bigelow Aerospace, has proposed to build space hotels in low Earth orbit. From that effort, we were really able to focus on the technology, but also demonstrating it. And that was key for us to demonstrate it and show that we could build these and test them and that it was possible to really use inflatables. And so with that, we've been designing a variety of concepts, such as this combo lander, where you don't take the habitat off the lander, but you, it's fully integrated. So when you land, then you're ready to go, you inflate it, and the crew is able to make use of that additional volume in space. <clears throat> and that's been a big uh, effort towards this. Um, during the Lunar Architecture Habitat days, we developed a lot of concepts, small habitats and, and large habitats, as well as mobile habitats. So we put a lot of emphasis towards mobility and moving the habitats around. So, you know, the small habitats were, we took advantage of because of the launch uh, constraints that we had with our vehicles. But this, the, what we also did is looked at habitats that could be fully integrated with a lander or be mobile systems like the robotic system that you see here with the, uh, that gave us that advantage to move things around. Also worked on designing a mid-expandable, we call it the mid-expandable habitat. And that habitat actually let us um, package systems in the end cones, in the pressurized containers, but then the, expand the middle section to give us more volume to live and work in once we got deployed into our location that we were after. So we've really focused a lot now on mobile strategies, uh, being able to pick up the outposts, the pieces of it, and move it around to different locations. So we'll go for a month here or two months there and, and then actually m mobilize and move that outpost. And that's all about the exploration. The internal architecture is a key point of of designing, and so as architects, you know, we have to use our, our uh, principles of good design and efficient design to be able to lay these out for the crew psychological well-being of the habitats because they're there for a long time. There's long-term isolation confinement issues, and we focus on that, trying to give them that benefit. Part of what we do is um, we do uh, what we call rapid prototyping or earth analog testing. And that earth analog testing really gives us a chance to flush out the design, to work with the crew and, and work with uh, the mission planners as well as, as uh, mission control and work out the concepts, work out the operational concepts with the crew while we're uh, getting working out the, these tests. And so we focus a lot of, on testing and retesting and getting our systems up to speed making sure we're ready to go when we do end up going to the moon and Mars. And so one of the things we did in 2009, we had designed this um, concept, and it was two different module types. And this is a tuna can type uh, module. And with that, we were able to take and um, turn that into a rapid prototyping demonstration unit. We call it the habitat demonstration unit. And that unit was really a focal point for us because it, it became a focus for the engineering community and the architects, but also the technologies. And we went from PowerPoint to an operational system within a year testing in the desert. And that was a really big achievement. So I was able to gather six of the centers and take advantage of their technological achievements and integrate 20 technologies into this system, which was a really big deal for doing it in one year. So we were pretty happy with that effort. And that effort really has led us to, you know, understanding what constraints we have and where we're, you know, where our faults are. So we do a lot of testing. We uh, took the pressurized rover. We did the interface testing before we took it out to the desert. We took our systems. We had them in bench tops, and then we took them from the bench top into integrated testing uh, those technologies and getting them focused. And we do a lot of dry runs with the crew, making sure we're ready operationally, but also with mission control, making sure our systems were operational and ready to go for the testing. <clears throat> this effort has really helped us focus. Um, during 2010, we switched away from lunar exploration towards deep space. And with that, there was an inflatable loft. So that loft part of it, we added to our habitat demonstration unit and continue to focus and working on that. A big part of what we do is um, education outreach and STEM, which is uh, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, is a big part of that. In 2010, I started the Habitat or Exploration Habitat Academic Innovation Challenge. And that has been very, very successful. Um, Tracy Gill, I don't work that anymore, but Tracy Gill at Kennedy Space Center has been the champion in carrying that on for me. 
And that's really turned out to be a very good uh, effort to engage students and inspire them and be part of the process that we do for delivering and developing habitats and, and for the future of the moon and Mars. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, with that effort, we really was able to, to inspire a lot of students. Um, we had, during the first inaugural year, we had a design head-to-head -head challenge or a competition. Um, the University of, Houston, University of Wisconsin won that challenge and they were selected to go out to the desert with us and test. And part of that testing is really also to understand the robotic systems working with humans. And so we looked at that and we utilized that from the standpoint of uh, interfaces and understanding how the robots are gonna work with the habitats, but also work with the humans. This shows a, a, a version of the Robonaut here that was used to interface with the habitat. And that gave us a lot of understanding and, and getting us ready to go to the future. And so it's really important to go and do this analog testing. It's one thing to design it, but it's another thing to build it and test it. And I've always told my team to have the drive, desire, and determination. To you know, have the vision and, and take action and be determined to uh, execute that effort. That has really helped us focus in developing these uh, assets and getting us ready to go to the moon and Mars. <clears throat> Excuse me. This has been a, a, a lifelong journey for us, and this evolution of, of architecture is really gonna help us to go to moon, Mars, and beyond. It's, it's an evolution, and it's a love on my part that has really taken us uh, beyond that. And really, if you start to think about it, we're gonna be developing and moving towards colonization. And you know, I don't know when that'll happen, but it will happen, and we're gonna be part of that journey. Uh, journey. And you know, architects provide that hardware, that knowledge, and that uh, inspiration to provide the, the link and the path forward. You know, um, we eventually will get to colonization, but you know, space architecture is gonna be shaping our future. It is our future. This is our destiny. This is what we are going to do, and we will eventually do that in a, you know, in a very, very informative way, and I'm so glad that you were here to hear my talk. Thank you.